Do you ever hear about a book that sounds really good, so you order it, but then before it even gets to your house, you hear about another book that also sounds amazing, so you order that one too? And then that process just kind of repeats over and over and over again until you end up with a ridiculous pile of unread books that just linger at the side of your vision and just to the corner of your eye, no matter where you go in your house, it's almost like it's calling to you or calling you out. Every time you pass by, just little whispers about how you've bought so many books and you haven't read any of them. And why did you just order another book when we're all sitting right here unread? And even when they're not whispering to you, you know, just the silent judgment is enough to make you start to feel a little self-conscious, maybe a little overwhelmed by the prospect of even starting because it's just become such an undertaking that the idea of pulling a single book out of that stack and just kind of makes you feel like at any moment that gigantic TBR pile is going to topple over and crush you, if not physically, then at least emotionally and psychologically. And it all just gets to be too much to the point where you avoid acknowledging that the pile exists at all. Because if so, you're me and I am you. We are one. Basically, I have a ridiculous number of unread books in physical form sitting in piles and baskets around me here on the floor and also taking up two shelves of my bookshelf that I have started to get this irrational fear of tackling because it's just become this huge, overwhelming prospect of a task. Do you know what's not an overwhelming task? Buying a new book that you're excited about that feels not wholly real until it arrives in your hands and then you realize it's yet one more to add to your ridiculous pile and the shame spiral starts all over again. And listen, I'm an adult, okay, apparently, and I know logically that the best way to handle this overwhelm is just to start, pick up one of those books, read it, and then repeat that however many times I need to to get to the bottom of the pile. And listen, I'm not counting the number because it's going to hurt my soul. And if I do that, if I read them, then there will be less of them, and then it will be less overwhelming. And considering the fact that I do, in fact, want to read all of these books, I haven't decided I'm not interested in any of them. I'm just overwhelmed by how many there are. It seems like a win-win to me. And that's where this video comes in. I decided I would challenge myself to read as many books from my physical TBR pile as I possibly could in 72 hours as a bit of a kick-starting motivation thing to get me going. Now, when I say 72 hours, I don't mean I'm going to be literally reading for the entire 72 hours because again, I'm an adult. I have a job. I have needs like a solid eight hours of sleep a night. So I'm not going to stay up for 72 hours straight to read, nor am I going to ignore all my responsibilities and not do anything else and just read for 72 hours. I'm going to live my normal life, you know, doing what I do, but I'm going to focus on spending as much of my free time as possible reading, even more so than I already do. And in all that time that I'm reading, I'm going to be focusing on my physical TBR pile. So listen, I know that's not as exciting as, you know, staying up for 72 hours straight or something, pulling all-nighters to get those goals. But listen, I'm 30 years old now. And as much as I feel internally at least a decade younger, it's just, I'm just not, okay? And if I get less than seven hours of sleep in a night, I become a total zombie. <laughs> I can't do it, but this is going to be a reasonable challenge, a reasonable version of how many books I can actually read in 72 hours in just my regular free time. So right now as I'm filming this is Saturday evening. So I'm going to continue this challenge to Sunday evening, Monday evening, and Tuesday evening will be when I do the final update for how this video went. I have picked out the first book I'm going to read for this challenge because it's the most recent one that I have received and it's actually kind of a special one. This is the first physical arc that I have ever received. I honestly feel like I'm going to cry a little bit. Does this mean I'm a real booktuber? Really though, I've been getting digital arcs and ALCs for years now, but I have never been sent a literal physical book by a publisher before the book came out and I'm excited about it. Okay, so let me just, let me have a moment. <laughs> I decided, since this is a special one for me, it's a first, that it would be fun for it to be the first book I read in this video, and also just because it's the most recent book I've added to my ridiculous CBR pile. But anyway, the book that I'm talking about is The Collected Regrets of Clover, and it came in an adorable box, so I thought I'd do a little mini unboxing experience. The box says, death she gets, it's life she can't quite figure out. We've got the book, matching cover to the box. I love the attention to detail. So this is the book, The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brommer. What's the point of giving someone a beautiful death if you can't give yourself a beautiful life? 
from the day she watched her kindergarten teacher drop dead during a dramatic telling of Peter Rabbit. That is traumatic. Clover Brooks has felt a stronger connection with the dying than she has with the living. After the beloved grandfather who raised her dies alone while she's traveling, Clover becomes a death doula in New York City, dedicating her life to ushering people peacefully through their end-of-life process. Clover spends so much time with the dying that she has no life of her own, until the final wishes of a feisty old woman send Clover on a road trip across the country to uncover a forgotten love story and perhaps her own happy ending. As she finds herself struggling to navigate the uncharted waters of romance and friendship, Clover is forced to examine what she really wants and whether she'll have the courage to go after it. Probing, clever, and hopeful, the collected regrets of Clover turns the normally taboo subject of death into a reason to celebrate life. Which sounds super interesting. It sounds right up my alley, to be honest. And it's signed. I have very few signed books in my collection. I'm trying to think if I have any other ones. That's special. Exciting. And there's a tote bag in there, which is so cute. It's got the flowers on it, and it says, if you want something you don't have, you have to do something you've never done. The Collected Regrets of Clover. So cute. I can always use more little bags to carry my 700 books that I'm always in the middle of reading around. Perfect. Amazing. Adorable. Okay, hopefully I'll enjoy it. It would be a bit of a bummer if I didn't, so... I will get started reading this and I will come back as soon as I'm done to give you my thoughts and then we'll see what book I pick next and and we'll just see how many I can get to in the next three days. Also, one more thing before I go, you might have noticed that I'm looking really snazzy in this pressed cotton white shirt. And that's because this video is sponsored by Grana. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them right now. Grana was founded in 2014 by Australian entrepreneur Luke Grana. Grana is an international online apparel brand making luxury modern essentials using the finest fabrics from around the world. Grana is the go-to brand for well-made work-to-leisure items that have longevity potential with guaranteed quality made to last past the season. And they focus on just a few fabrics that they know inside and out. Mongolian cashmere, Chinese silk, American Sapima cotton, and and Tencel. They also match an affordable price point with luxury level minimalism. Grana believes that you shouldn't have to accept low quality along with low prices. Their focus really is high quality basics that are made well from the finest fabrics that aren't going to break the bank. Sapima cotton makes up less than 1% of the total cotton grown in the world, and it's twice as strong as regular cotton, which makes for extraordinarily resilient pieces. It has longer fibers that resist pulling, breaking, and tearing, and it's inherently softer and more luxurious than regular cotton. It also retains color better than other cottons because of its super fine fibers that allow the dye to fully permeate. Tencel, on the other hand, is a super fun fabric if you're into sustainable fashion. It's made from wood pulp that's farmed sustainably on eucalyptus plantations without irrigation or chemical pesticides and fertilizers. It's also produced in a closed loop system, which means that virtually all of the chemicals used in the process are captured and reused instead of emitting them into the environment. Tencel is breathable, light, and wrinkle resistant, not to mention hypoallergenic, antimicrobial, and entirely biodegradable. It also has a really nice fluid drape and such a soft feel. Seriously, Tencel is so soft. <laughs> I love it. Grana sent me four of their beautiful pieces and I'm going to be featuring them throughout this video. So if you like what you see, you can shop the products in the description box. I'll have them all linked for you and you can find a discount code down there to save on your purchase. Thank you so much to Grana for sponsoring this video and sending me these beautiful pieces. The quality is out of this world and I feel so put together. So without further ado, no more procrastinating right now this very moment, I'm starting on my physical TBR. Let's do it.
feeling a lot of feelings. This was really good. I just... With a good eating minute. Hey, I'm just popping in here literally seconds after finishing this book to recommend it to all of you because as you might be able to tell, <clears throat> I'm a sobbing mess <laughs> having just finished this book. And if you're someone who loves a heartwarming book about someone coming to terms with loss and learning to live again or to live their life to its fullest in honor of the person they lost instead of living stuck in the past, then... I highly recommend this book. It was fantastic. I'm very emotional. <laughs> I'm feeling pretty sad that it's over. <laughs> I wasn't really ready um, to let go of all the characters. I'm not usually one asking for sequels that much. I'm typically more of a fan of standalones, but I really hope that the author writes a sequel because I would love to see more of Clover's happy ending. <laughs> Who I would recommend this to would be anyone who's interested in big conversations around life and death, the meaning of life, about, you know, different cultural interpretations of death, how we process loss or avoid processing and talking about death and grief. It's really, really beautiful. There are so many poignant, heartwarming, touching moments. And there are so many amazing characters in this book. I think Claudia was my favorite by far. I adored her so much. And Leo was amazing too. Really appreciated that as much as I cried like a little baby as I got to the end of this book and several times throughout. It just has such a lovely, hopeful message at the end. And there's so many sprinklings of wisdom throughout. I really loved how the author incorporated the final words of many of the people that Clover or helped at the end of their lives as just little reminders to the reader to, you know, take life by the horns and to live life to its fullest because maybe there's no way for us to come to the end of our lives with zero regrets, but at least we can know that we tried and that we lived, you know, and I feel like that's really sort of the message here. And I think it's really beautiful. So those are my emotional thoughts on this book, The Collected Regrets of Clover by Mickey Brommer. Please go check this book out. I highly, highly recommend it. So beautiful. And I'm so grateful that St. Martin's Press sent me a copy to read because this is definitely a new favorite. Five stars for sure. I want to read just a couple of my favorite quotes here. This quote is short but sweet, but I really loved it on page 191. Coming from Claudia, of course, she's such a deep well of wisdom. It's easy to glamorize the path you didn't take. This is another one that I enjoyed as a music lover. As the lights dimmed and the audience hushed, I closed my eyes and turned into the ripples of anticipation that always came at the beginning of a live performance. That shared intimacy among strangers where, for just a moment, Everyone laid aside the baggage of life to be completely present as one, a communal hopefulness. I breathed in the soothing woody scent of the instruments and the peak of a freshly rosined bow. And then a little bit later, I felt the audience breathe a collective sigh as they settled into the music's embrace. Just beautiful. Yeah, this is a really special book. I'm really, really glad I read it. And I'm glad it was my first pick for this video because it's such a lovely way to start this. And it also has made me really want to jump into something else because I feel that gaping void of emptiness where this book has been for the last day and a little bit and I need to fill it with something else because I'm feeling a little bereft which I suppose is appropriate for this book but wow highly recommend yeah really beautiful and now it's time to pick my second book for this video and I was looking at my various piles and baskets and shelves trying to think of what might be an interesting pick. And I have a lot of interesting books, so it was a bit of a challenge. But the one that my eye kept coming back to is also, I guess, a little bit of a more recent addition to my collection, but one that I've been hearing about for, I feel like, at least a year at this point, which is Luster by Raven and Leilani. This one, I feel like, got really popular on TikTok during the female rage obsession. I did make a video reading popular female rage books from TikTok, which I can link for you if you missed that one. But this book was in the running for which ones I was picking to do for that video. And I just ended up picking other ones over this one. But I kept thinking about this one after that. And I kept seeing more people talking about it, recommending it. So I decided to buy it just so that I could read it at some point. And I just feel like now's the time. I feel like I'm in the mood to read this right now. But this book is about Edie, who is a Black woman in her 20s, and she gets wrapped 
wrapped up into this very complicated relationship. And it's supposed to be comedic and sexually charged and all about Edie coming to terms with her hunger and her anger, very much in line with the female rage trope. And I found in my female rage video that I tended to seemingly enjoy <laughs> books that had this kind of a vibe of a woman really coming into her own in terms of her anger. So I feel like this is going to be very interesting and I'm hoping that I enjoy it as much as I did some of the other books I read in that challenge. So this one's next. I really hope that I love this and give it five stars, but I am hoping that it's going to be a little less emotional and neglected regrets of clover because i feel like i need a tone shift i need something a little different to kind of recover from the emotional whirlwind that was the end of that book so i'm hoping that this will be enough of a shift in tone that it'll help me sort of move on <laughs> from that book so also i'm wearing another piece by grana today it's a beautiful knit dress i was going to film my outfit outside but it looks like it's about to rain hard. It went from being very sunny out to being very dark and Mordor-like in about 20 minutes. So probably not going to go outside, but this is a super comfy dress. I'm in love with it. It is also in the uh, Supima cotton material. It's super soft. I'll be back soon to give you my thoughts. Fancy meeting you here. I am back for another update. When I said that I was picking this as a bit of a palette cleanser from the Collected Regrets of Clover for a bit of a pivot in tone to pull me out of the emotional maelstrom I was in in finishing that book, I would say that my estimation of this book was correct because it was definitely a huge shift in tone. So like I said earlier, Luster is a book about Edie, who is in her early 20s, who starts dating a older white man. He is twice her age, and he and his wife have just decided to transition their marriage into an open relationship, and she set up these rules for him to follow. And Edie is the first woman that he is dating in 12 or 13 years, something like that. This book definitely focuses primarily on Edie's experiences. And I think what's really interesting about this book, and I guess this book in comparison to this book, is that as much as, yes, they are very different in terms of tone, they actually have a lot more similarities than I had originally expected. The protagonists are quite different in both cases. Here we have Clover, a white woman in her mid to late 30s, who at the outset of the novel has never been kissed. And here we have Edie, a black woman in her early 20s, who has had scores of sexual experiences and her 
conquests of the men around her, co-workers, etc., have sort of become part and parcel of her identity and her coping strategies for the difficulties of life. So on the surface, they seem like very different characters, and they are. They are very different. But they both share this deep core of loneliness, this slight emptiness, this bereft quality where they're both a little numb to their lives and they react to that in different ways. Clover closes herself up in her apartment with her dog and her two cats and avoids contact with other people as much as she can. And we see inklings of a similar sort of isolation in Edie, but she reacts by seeking out that human connection, human touch, by having these sexual experiences that make her feel seen and held and acknowledged as a human being, if only for a fleeting moment. So I found it interesting to see those parallels and to see how both books deal so directly with this loneliness and longing for human connection on a variety of levels. But talking about Lester a little bit more specifically, I will say that I adored the writing here. The writing is very raw and piercing, bleak at times, very darkly funny <laughs> and irreverent. It's also incredibly graphic in its descriptions of just day-to-day -day mundane things and very clinical, I suppose, in its descriptions of things that maybe in other works would be written in a more lyrical or poetic fashion, trying to sort of couch the crudeness of day-to-day -day life in flowery language. And this book is beautifully written, but it's written in a very matter-of-fact way that doesn't for even a moment hide from the ugliness of life. And I really, really loved it. I found so many moments that I was really drawn to turns of phrase. I chuckled a lot because the author is quite funny and there's a lot of little quips and observations and comparisons that that were very funny, even as they might be uncomfortable or a bit distressing. Getting ready for a date, talking about her pre-date routine. I put on a complex pair of underwear that is not so much underwear as a bundle of string, and I stand before the mirror. I think to myself, you are a desirable woman. You are not a dozen gerbils in a skin casing. I find the dark humor very entertaining, and I felt like the author's voice was so clear, which gave Edie an incredibly clear and ringing voice on the page. She, from the very first line, feels like a completely realized human being, full of flaws and ugly bits that she wants to hide away, and insecurities, and past traumas, scars, but also little bits of childlike excitement about the world. She's still in her early 20s and quite young, but she's seen a lot, so she has this sort of feeling of being jaded, but you can still see glimpses of that, you know, earnest, almost naive hope and her joy when it comes to art, which is what she's most passionate about, painting, even though she's been dealing with a pretty prolonged streak of artist's block. Here's another quote that gives you a feel for Edie as a protagonist. His joy is raw, in a way that makes me feel like I can unzip my skin suit and show him all the ooze inside. But not yet. I just, I love it. I love being inside Edie's head. She's fantastic. But she's also, you know, going through a lot. She has experienced a lot in her short life. She is dealing with a lot of, like I said, bone deep loneliness and some trauma to do with the loss of her mother and also living in a really precarious situation in New York City as someone without a financial safety net, struggling with making ends meet and surviving at her soul-sucking job in publishing, specifically the publishing of children's books. And I was pleasantly surprised by how much of this book was about the experience of being a bit of a tortured, struggling artist, which again, I can relate to. There was one quote, not quite halfway through the book, that I felt kind of gave an inkling of what the author was aiming for with this book, or at least one of the themes or one of the ideas she was shooting for, where she's talking about having worked on K-5 through Maya Angelou and Frida Kalu biographies, where some of their more traumatic experiences were omitted, starting the quote here, per a Provo parents group who weren't ready for their kids to see the blood women wade through to create 
art. And it just felt like that was really an indication of what the author was saying about the experience of being a woman creating art. And there's a lot of really fascinating passages throughout about Edie's experience trying to grasp something real through her art and to get true inspiration to really be connected to what she's creating and how difficult it is to find it until she's in a place of precarity and struggling and suffering in a lot of ways. And that's when the inspiration strikes and when she finally feels able to create. So really fascinating. I loved the subplot about her experience as an artist because I didn't realize going into it that this book had anything to do with the arts. But I also loved that the book, as much as it's set up in such a way that you expect it to be focusing on Edie's relationship with men, and it does touch on quite a bit how she relates to men and how she uses them essentially as coping mechanisms, sometimes damaging coping mechanisms, rather than working on some of the larger issues at play. It pivots pretty quickly to be more about Edie's relationship with the women around her, whether it's the only other Black female co-worker at her publishing firm, whether it's her relationship with her late mother or with Rebecca, her boyfriend's wife, who invites her to stay with them, or their adopted daughter, Akila, or with herself. So much of this book touches on Edie's loneliness, but there's also an exploration of power dynamics, gender dynamic, power imbalances, wealth disparity, racism, and the experience of being a young Black woman in relationships and in the workplace. It also touches a little bit on police brutality and racism from the police. And at the base of everything, the drive that's pushing the narrative forward is the quiet, rumbling, roiling rage in ED that is hovering just below the surface and only bubbles up in rare moments, like when she's gripping a paintbrush. Very, very interesting. Like I said, a completely different tone from The Collected Regrets of Clover, but I loved it. Just, I just loved it in a completely different way. I find it interesting. I would be really curious if any of you watching this have read both of these and if you liked both of them, because I feel like the target audience of these two books would be pretty different. But for whatever reason, the multifaceted person that I am can appreciate both of these books as different as they are. So I am also going to give Lester five stars, which is kind of wild. I read two books for this video and so far we're two for two, five stars each. I mean, to be fair, when I buy a fiscal copy of a book 99.9% .9 of the time, I'm buying it with the assumption that I'm going to love it, which is why I want to read it and own a physical copy of it. But I'm still surprised to have two five-star reads. Maybe this is working for me, really letting myself pick things that are really appealing to me, that I'm drawn to most out of the pile, and I'm really Really picking up those things that are new favorites, but it's awesome. So I really love this really penetrating, piercing, raw, uncompromising writing that was, like the back says, razor sharp and slyly comic. I think that's a great way to describe it. I'm very impressed that this was Raven Leilani's debut novel. And that brings us to the final book that I'm reading for this video. Book three in 72 hours almost felt like it jumped off the shelf into my hands when I was looking for my next read this morning, The Bloody Chamber by Angela. Carter. Now this one, it's not the oldest book on my TBR shelf, but it is one of the oldest based on classic fairy tales and legends. And I've been wanting to read this for forever because I constantly hear how amazing it is. And I'm so glad I picked it up. I have read just the first story of the collection, which is the title story, The Bloody Chamber, which is based on the story of Bluebeard. So I'm familiar with the story of Bluebeard. I've read the original story, but it was really interesting to read Angela Carter version. It has a bit of a feminist leaning, which I appreciated. And I really enjoyed how much personality was imbued into the female protagonist who, in the original story, from what I recall, doesn't have quite so much of a personality going on. And here she felt a lot more fully realized, I suppose. I also loved her mother, who is a character that, if she existed in the original story, I don't remember her at all. But in this version of the story, she is an absolute badass. And I loved that. That. just as creepy and unsettling and dark and twisted as the original version of the tale, but in 
incredibly beautifully written. So like I said, I've only read the first story. It is less than 50 pages long and I've used 5 billion tabs already. I actually needed to assign two different tab colors to beautiful writing, essentially. I have one color for quotes that I love, but I also have a color for just beautiful descriptions of things. Stand out on their own so much as a quote that I want to pull out of the text, but they're just so beautifully written and so evocative that I needed to highlight and mark them. I physically couldn't continue without acknowledging how beautiful they were. Oh, here. Okay, I found it. And in the description of the castle, which I loved, the fairy solitude of the place, with its turrets of misty blue, its courtyard, its spiked gate, his castle that lay on the very bosom of the sea, with seabirds mewing about its attics, the casements opening onto the green and purple, evanescent departures of the ocean, cut off by the tide from land for half a day. That castle, at home neither on the land nor on the water, a mysterious amphibious place, contravening the materiality of both earth and the waves, with the melancholy of a mermaiden who perches on her rock and waits endlessly for a lover who had drowned far away long ago. That lovely, sad sea siren of a place. Like, excuse me? <laughs> Are you kidding? Absolutely gorgeous. And there's so many descriptions like that, even just the tiniest descriptions of what they're wearing. Like, there was a dress for her too. Black silk with the dull prismatic sheen of oil on water. Get out of here with these descriptions, Miss Angela Carter. I'm absolutely in love with the writing. And of course, I marked a billion of these little descriptive <laughs> passages that I loved. But then there are also, you know, quotes specifically that stood out to me. The pounding of my heart mimicking that of the great pistons ceaselessly thrusting the train that bore me through the night. Away from Paris, away from girlhood, away from the white enclosed quietude of my mother's apartment, into the un guessable country of marriage. I knew I had behaved exactly according to his desires, had he not bought me so that I should do so. I had been tricked into my own betrayal, to that illimitable darkness whose source I had been compelled to seek in his absence. And, now that I had met that shadowy reality of his that came to life only in the presence of its own atrocities, I must pay the price of my new knowledge." the secret of Pandora's box, but he had given me the box himself, knowing I must learn the secret. I had played a game in which every move was governed by a destiny as oppressive and omnipotent as himself, since that destiny was himself, and I had lost. Lost at that charade of innocence and vice in which he had engaged me. Lost as the victim loses to the executioner. Damn. So basically, I feel like I did a great job picking the three books for this video because I have an inkling, having finished the title story from the short story collection, that this is also going to be a five-star read, which would mean I would be three for three, five stars across the board, which would be, I think, unheard of. I'm not sure I've ever done a reading challenge video where I gave every single book I read five stars. So yeah, it's going great so far. Also, you might notice that I am wearing my white button down from Grana again. I'm wearing the final outfit that they sent me, the button down and a gorgeous pair of trousers. So I will also show you my outfit. So I'm back to finish up this video, give you my final thoughts on all three of the books. So I finished about 10 minutes ago the final story of The Bloody Chamber by Angela Carter, and I'm a little bit conflicted. Okay, I loved the first story so much. It was such an easy five stars. And one other story later on, The Earl King, I adored as well and would give five stars. But none of the other stories in this collection would 
quite reach a five-star read for me. And there were a couple, two to be exact, that just didn't quite work as well for me. I would probably give them somewhere around a two-star individually for those stories. And when I add up all my ratings and get an average, I come out somewhere around a three and a half to a four star range. And I just feel so conflicted about that because that first story specifically, which is by far the longest, the title story is so fantastic. And a bunch of the other stories that I would probably give three or four star ratings to, I really enjoyed, but they just didn't have that extra little something to really take them over the edge to be a five star read. So I don't know. It feels a little blasphemous not to give this five stars. And I'm a bit sad to think about giving it something less than five stars because I was so excited about the prospect of having three out of three five star reads for this video. This is my struggle. Every time any of you who have watched my rating videos for a while, and you've seen me try to review other short story collections, you know that I struggle so much with rating the overall collection because often there are at least a few stories that I absolutely adore. So the idea of giving a collection anything less than five stars just feels wrong. But there are usually at least one story, if not multiple stories that just aren't really my cup of tea. And so giving it five stars also feels wrong. I don't know. I might change my mind in the future. I will, of course, link my Goodreads in the description box so you can go add me as a friend on there if you haven't already. And you can see all my written reviews. For me right now, having literally just finished it a couple minutes ago, I'm going to say four stars is a more accurate depiction of my feelings. I made little notes on my phone with my ratings for each of the stories. So I can give you a quick rundown for anyone who's read this if you're curious. So The Bloody Chamber gets five stars. The Courtship of Mr. Leon, that one was not my favorite. I gave it two stars. The Tiger's Bride was another two-star read for me. There were some really interesting ideas there, but something about the way it was executed just left me a little bit cold. Puss in Boots I thought was really fun. I'd probably give it somewhere three and a half, maybe even four stars. The Earl King, like I said, five stars. The Snow Child is a rough read. It's very short, but it's unsettling. I'd probably give it four stars. The Lady of the House of Love, I would also give four stars. The Werewolf was three for me. The Company of Wolves, I would give four. And then the final story, Wolf Alice, I would give three. Um, what I will say in general, um, I mean, I did give my impression of The Bloody Chamber on the last update, and that one is by far my favorite story. I would also say a lot of the things that I enjoyed about The Bloody Chamber were also true about the Earl King. I found it very beautifully written, very haunting, and it had a slow buildup of tension, that eeriness, the slight dissonance that starts to make you feel a little uncomfortable as you're reading. The hairs stand up on the back of your neck, and the more you read, the more unsettled you become right up to the end when you sort of get the reveal of what's happening. Quotes like, his embraces were his enticements, and yet, oh yet, they were the branches of which the trap itself was woven. My favorite quote from the Earl King was definitely this one, which was, He strips me to my last nakedness, that underskin of mauve, pearlized satin, like a skinned rabbit, then dresses me again in an embrace so lucid and encompassing it might be made of water, and shakes over me dead leaves as if into the stream I have become. Really great. Loved that story. As for the other stories, generally the range of my enjoyment and not had to do a lot with the language. I was surprised to find that the tone of the storytelling or the language used wasn't as uniform across the stories as I had expected. Um, and some of the more sort of straightforward, matter of fact tellings didn't do quite as much for me, especially the stories that were quite a bit shorter. Just felt like there wasn't as much to cling to in those stories to really draw me in and make me feel the sort of magic that can come from a fairy tale. But some of those stories like Puss in Boots or The Lady of the House of Love, they were much more matter of fact, but they had more of a tongue in cheek, humorous, lighthearted, sort of witty undertone that I appreciated. Puss in Boots is certainly the more lighthearted of the two, uh, the more irreverent, but the Lady of the House of Love still sort of had that feeling to it where it was a little bit tongue in cheek, sort of poking fun at itself, especially near the end. Definitely a really interesting combination of stories. 
So anyway, those are my thoughts on this. Like I said, a range of feelings for the different stories, but the stories I loved, I really, really loved. I enjoyed the more female-centric feminist take on a lot of these stories where the female protagonists have more agency, even if they aren't completely in control, even if they are still at the mercy of whatever the antagonist of the story is, there's still more awareness on their part. We get to see more into their internal lives and thoughts. They're more fully developed. They're more three-dimensional human beings. And there's definitely a repeated through line of coming of age, becoming a woman, the development of female desire, the initial fear, and then acceptance of their own desire as women. It's not that I was disappointed by the rest of the stories. I just loved the first story, The Bloody Chamber, so much that it really raised my expectations. And then the other stories weren't all as fully developed or as beautifully lyrically written as the first story. If this had been rearranged and The Bloody Chamber was the last story, I think I would have enjoyed all of the other ones more because I wouldn't have been comparing them to the Bloody Chamber. But that's just my personal opinion, as with everything I'm talking about in this video. That's the Bloody Chamber. Unfortunately, not giving all of the books in this video five stars, but two five-star reads and a four-star read is not too shabby. So wildly successful, I would say. I am three books down on my very long physical TBR that doesn't have an exact number because I don't want to know and make myself feel sad. I'm definitely feeling motivated to keep tackling my pile. I encourage you all to try something like this. If you have a lot of books on your TBR pile and you're feeling overwhelmed, maybe try setting yourself a challenge. It doesn't have to be 72 hours. And now I have three new favorites, even if they aren't all five stars, they're definitely all new favorites that I can recommend to all my fellow book lovers out there, which is awesome. Thank you for helping me achieve all my goals. I appreciate you all so much. I feel like this video is going to be a long one. So if you made it all the way to the end, I know you're a real one. So leave some sort of emoji that reminds you of one of these three books in the comments down below. Also, of course, let me know in the comments if you've read any of these books. I wanna know your thoughts. Whether you agree with me or not, I love to hear your opinions on the books that I share on my channel. So it's very late and I would like to go to sleep. So I'm going to wrap this up. Thank you so much for watching this video. Thank you again to Grana for sponsoring this video and for sending me such beautiful pieces of clothing. My husband is a very big fan of this shirt in particular. The couple times I've worn it, he has been effusive in his compliments. So be sure to check out Grana if you're looking for those pieces that are really great transition pieces from work to your personal life that are high quality, made to last, but also at an affordable price. Of course, you can use my discount code Elizabeth40 for 40% off. Use the link in the description box to shop and check out the links for the specific pieces I featured in this video if you're interested in them. Thank you as always to my patrons for your support. I appreciate you all so so much and with that i'm gonna get going thank you for watching and i'll see you really soon in my next one bye friends